11 Together, WTVD. With Catherine Walters, Skip Carpenter, and Stan Saunders, this is Eyewitness News. Good evening. The U.S. will not be sending a team to the Moscow Olympic Games. That was a decision today by the U.S. Olympic Committee. A report from Gary Shepard in Colorado Springs. The vote was two to one in favor of boycotting the Summer Games. It came after nearly a full day of deliberations, which began after the House of Delegates heard Vice President Walter Mondale declare there was no longer a choice between sports and national security. The Olympic boycott, he said, is a keystone in America's response to the invasion of Afghanistan. Your vote today is a test of our will, of our confidence, of our values, and of our power to keep the peace through peaceful means. Mondale characterized the vote as a referendum on freedom, and he called on Olympic athletes to join farmers, businessmen, and other Americans who are also making sacrifices. We recognize the enormous price we are asking our athletes to pay. I believe all Americans will thank you. A heavy burden is on your shoulders today. The vice president also promised federal financial aid to the U.S. Olympic Committee, which already has a $1.2 million deficit this year. Contributions are down sharply as a result of the boycott. Late in the day, after first rejecting one proposal to send a team to Moscow, the House of Delegates voted to support President Carter, 1,604 in favor of the boycott, 797 against, two abstentions. As you also, I'm sure, know, that it uh, is a vote for, the, for President Carter's viewpoint. And the uh, United States Olympic Committee, I believe, is supporting him in a um, substantial way. The final resolution declares that because the nation's security is threatened, the United States Olympic Committee will not send a team to Moscow this summer unless President Carter advises by May 20th that the situation has changed. That is not expected to happen. Gary Shepard, CBS News, Colorado Springs. Well, the decision by the U.S. Olympic Committee was one of two victories for President Carter today. On the hostages issue, it was reported today that our Western allies and Japan will follow American sanctions against Iran if the hostages are not released by a specific date. President Carter has set a deadline for the release of the hostages, but hasn't made the date public. Carter told foreign journalists today he has not ruled out any of his options in dealing with Iran. We prefer to keep our action non-belligerent in nature, but we reserve the right to take other, whatever action is necessary to secure the safe release of our hostages. Uh, you said, Mr. President, you have not much time. Yes. Can you give us an idea of timing? Well, it's not a matter of, of many weeks or certainly not a matter of months. It's uh, not appropriate for me now to set a specific date, but we have uh, sent to the heads of nations uh, all of those represented by you, a specific date uh, at which time we would expect this common effort to be successful. An eight-year-old Durham boy drowned today in Carr Lake. Jonathan Belton slipped off a bank and drowned in a foot of water. The accident happened during a family fishing trip. An auto accident claimed two lives. 33-year-old Gary Evans of Greensboro was killed when his car struck a tree in Wayne County. And 21-year-old Stephen Barefoot of Four Oaks was killed when his car hit a tree today on Route 701 near Smithfield. In Wrightsville, Georgia this week, there's been a series of incidents between the town's blacks and whites. Today, both groups planned demonstrations and the governor of Georgia sent in state troopers to prevent violence. Martha Teichner reports. A week of racial tension simmered into a morning of uneasiness in Wrightsville. Instead of doing their Saturday errands, the people just waited and watched as robed Ku Klux Klansmen from as far away as Louisiana stood in the street and signed up members where there have been no official members before. It's just a tension here in town that we're 
being pushed where we've got no business being pushed. Wrightsville isn't really any different than a lot of other little southern towns. The kind of place that the changes brought about in the civil rights era appear to have missed until now. <laughs> But now Wrightsville is the latest front in what is becoming an annual battle between whites and blacks, fought not just by the people who live in a town, but by outsiders, leaders of their causes, here by self-styled white racist J.B. Stoner. The civil rights laws are communist laws. They need to all be repealed. Joseph Lowry, president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, led black marchers. And we go march and pray and vote and sing and walk and boycott until the dirt of racial discrimination is separated from the fabric of life. One hundred fifty Georgia State troopers kept black and white demonstrators separated on the Johnson County Courthouse steps in Wrightsville. The demonstrations ended peacefully, but today's incident could easily be the beginning of a summer of confrontation in Wrightsville. Martha Teichner, CBS News, Wrightsville, Georgia. Black campus ministers from around the country have been in the Triangle area this week. Dr. Malvin Good with the National Black Network gave the closing address today to the annual convocation of ministries to blacks in higher education. This year the theme was Visions for the 80s, Higher Education and the Church. The campus ministers are the only organization of its kind in the country and for the last three days they've been discussing issues that will face black people in this decade. A Dare County forest fire is still raging out of control tonight. The blaze has already consumed 18,000 acres of boggy pine forest and continues to spread. Authorities say the fire will not be contained for several days and are hoping for rain to help slow the blaze. Weekend traffic was stalled along the Raleigh Beltline today because of a roadside grass fire. Cars piled up along the off-ramp onto Western Boulevard. Firemen put the blaze out in less than an hour, but not before several motorists stopped to lend a helping hand by lifting hoses and allowing traffic to pass through. Officials still aren't sure how the fire began. Well, Eyewitness News will return in a moment. This week on the Million Dollar Movie, Vivian Lee and Marlon Brando star in A Streetcar Named Desire. Listen, baby, when we first met you and me, you thought I was common. Thousands of years have passed him right by, and there he is, Stanley Kowalski, survivor of the Stone Age. Yeah, I once went out with a dame who told me I'm the glamorous type. She says, I am the glamorous type. I says, so what? Hey, Stella! A Streetcar Named Desire, this week's Million Dollar Movie, Saturday at 11.30. While inflation and unemployment are growing around the country, there's a bit of good news facing the South. A federal study says Sunbelt states got two-thirds of the nation's new jobs created over the last decade. The report says low taxes, low public assistance levels, and other factors created a favorable business climate in the South. The Carolinas were rated as the fifth most favorable states in the study. Well, walking across the street can be just as dangerous for adult dodgers as it is for children. Diana Williams reports that in Chapel Hill, people are giving more thought to the old safety rule, look before you cross. Last week, one person was killed and another seriously injured while trying to cross the street in Chapel Hill. Over the last five years, the number of pedestrian accidents has been increasing. Already this year, there have been seven accidents. Chapel Hill's traffic problem and the large student population makes pedestrian safety a big problem for city police. Jaywalking is against the law, but it's hard to control. The recent accidents have prompted Chapel Hill's town council to take action. They want to educate drivers to be more careful, and there's talk of putting in new crosswalks. Uh -huh. Do you think that there should be a crosswalk or something to make it easier for you instead of just kind of jaywalking across? That's a good point, isn't it? Yep. Definitely. Well, I'm just visiting for the day, but it would have been nice to have a crosswalk here. Yes. There should definitely be a crosswalk here. Without a doubt. It's very dangerous, and the number of people that cross here every day is pretty large. I swore I'm going to get hit one of these days. Fraternities and sororities are asking the city to put in a crosswalk here, across from the planetarium. But until they do, students will continue their mad dash across the street. 
Diana Williams, Channel 11 Eyewitness News. Liberian President William Tolbert was killed and his government overthrown today in the first coup in that West African nation's 133-year history. Just a few hours later, revolutionary supporters took over the Liberian consulate in New York City. Alan Mendelson reports. The elite ruling class days are gone. I thank you. That's the way the students proclaimed their occupation of the Liberian consulate in New York City. A small group of unarmed Liberian students took control of the offices shortly after news of the coup was received. What is not clear is whether the students occupied the mission offices at the directions of the new Liberian government or if they acted on their own. The students took control, they say, to protect vital government documents. Because if we do not do that, the uh, old government they probably might destroy many of our official documents. And it's our responsibility to protect and secure our property. The United States ambassador to the United Nations, Donald McHenry, spent more than an hour inside the consulate talking with the students, but he left without commenting to reporters. The students apparently will stay in control until directions from the new government are received. The vice consul under the deposed government was given a police escort to his New York home. Alan Mendelson, CBS News, New York. Well, we have sports in just a moment. Well, Stan continues his vacation, and Don <laughs> Shea so nicely continues to put in six nights a week of work. <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. I need to eat. <laughs> if Severiano Ballesteros needs a green jacket for his wardrobe, I feel pretty sure he knows where he can pick one up. Unless he breaks a leg, Ballesteros should become the second foreign golfer besides Gary Player to win the coveted Masters jacket. Seve had a 68 today and now has it 13 under par at Augusta and a seven-shot lead over Ed Fiore at 2.11. Jack Newton, Andy North, J.C. Sneed, and David Graham. At four under the defending champion Fuzzy Zeller, Jim Colpert and Gibby Gilbert, Tom Watson, Gary Player, and Hubert Green finished at 213. At 214, two under, but 11 back, Ben Crenshaw and Andy Bean. Then it's Lee Trevino, Johnny Miller, Jack Nicklaus, Arnold Palmer, and Ray Floyd. Arnie and Jack, who share nine Masters championships, will play together tomorrow. Defending champion Amy Alcott threw a three under par 69 at the rest of the field today and now leads the LPGA tournament at Raleigh's Northridge Country Club by a single blow. Her rounds of 68-67 put her at 137. That is seven under par. Sandra Post and Donna Capone Young shadowed Alcott in second place, only one swing off the pace. Post had a 67 and four birdies gave Young a round of 68. Alone at 143, Kathy Martin after a 70 at two under Marlene Floyd Julie Stanger Kathy Hyde Pat Adams and Lynn uh, Pat Hayes rather and Lynn Adams Mary Dwyer is at 143 and at even par 144 Kathy McMullen dot Germaine Alice Miller Sylvia Bertolaccini and Vicki Tabor footballs were also filling the spring air today and our cameras we're in Keenan Stadium for the Carolina Blue-White game. The contest was sort of a ho hummer for three quarters before both offenses got it in gear in the final period, lighting up the scoreboard for 30 points. The Whites won it 23-20 to when sophomore quarterback Rod Elkins hit tailback Calvin Bryant with a 46-yard pass as time ticked out. The Blues had taken the upper hand with 42 seconds left on an 18-yard touchdown area from Chuck Sharp to tight end Mike Chatham. Some individual numbers, Bryant carried for 90 yards, Billy Johnson rushed for 61, Elkins uh, passed for 94 yards, and Sharp combined for 218 yards. The Whites win it 23 to 20. At the Duke Spring game this afternoon, the Blues defeated the Whites 17 to 14 on a 16-yard touchdown pass from Brent Klinkscale to Marvin Brown with only 137 left. Now let's check the Major League scoreboard and see what we have. In the National League, Chicago over the Mets, 6-3. Cincinnati rallied to beat the Braves. Philadelphia over Montreal. And the Lumber Company, Pittsburgh 7, the Cardinals 2. LA 6, Houston 5, they went 17 innings, folks. San Francisco and San Diego are late. And King Kong Kingman was swinging the big lumber again for the Cubbies in their win over the Mets.
It was home run derby at Shea Stadium today. Joel Youngblood started the parade in his first at-bat of the season. He tagged the Cubs' Mike Kruko to right to give the Mets a 1-0 lead in the second. Trailing 2-0, the Cubs' Barry Foote nailed Mets reliever Neil Allen's first pitch into the bullpen. It was a 3-2 Cubs lead in the seventh. Dave Kingman did it both ways today, hitting two homers yesterday. He went back and left and robbed Jerry Morales' bid for a homer in the Mets' seventh. But Dan Norman hit a pinch shot in the same inning to narrow the Cubs' lead to 4-3 after seven. Kingman couldn't get that one. But Kong struck again. Kingman hit his third homer in two days. Also today, he found out he was not fined for his dumping ice water on the sports writer. Good day for Kingman all around. Mike Vale's pinch single closed out the scoring in the eighth, the final. Cubs six, Mets three. All right, let's check the American League scoreboard where the White Sox defeated the Orioles again. Milwaukee ran it up on Boston 18 to 1. New York and Texas were postponed. Kansas City over the Tigers 8 to 6. Minnesota, Minnesota that is, shut out Oakland 6 to nothing. Two games late on the coast, Cleveland and California, Toronto and Seattle. In the Carolina League, Durham and Winston-Salem were rained out in the Twin Cities. Kinston over Rocky Mount, we do not have any scores on Alexandria and Salem. Likewise, Peninsula and Lynchburg. And from hits and runs to jabs and hooks. Salvador Sanchez retained his WBC featherweight crown today with a unanimous 15-round decision over third-ranked contender Ruben Castillo. Sanchez will now face former champion Danny Little Red Lopez in a match June the 7th. Sanchez won the title from Lopez with a 13th-round knockout. Four N. BA games tomorrow. Let's look at the cards. Seattle at Milwaukee. The Bucks are up two to one over the defending champions. Los Angeles can wrap it up against Phoenix. The Lakers have won the first three. Game three between the Celtics and the Rockets. Boston has won the first two. We will televise that game at one o'clock. Philadelphia and Atlanta in the Omni. The Sixers lead the series two to one. Now let's look at the Bucks win last night over the defending champions. It was a double homecoming for the Bucks, returning to their home arena and their running game. Dave Myers gets his own rebound for two, and when they didn't run, they moved the ball well. This one's right off Don Nelson's chalkboard as Quinn Buckner shakes free for the baseline jumper. And for individual effort, watch Marcus Johnson. He had 16, and none were nicer than this move under the basket as the Bucks led 60 to 47 at the half. Seattle was able to close the gap in the fourth. Dennis Johnson goes behind his back to Johnny Johnson for the jumper, but they couldn't sustain the momentum. Bob Lanier led Milwaukee with 24, two on this beautiful roll around Jack Sigma. No overtime this time, 95-91 Milwaukee. They that is a look at sports. Thank you. We were busy today. I understand Carol Cookerly gets to sit in and yeah. stand tomorrow night. Got a little beauty coming on the set. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> <laughs> Eyewitness News will continue in a moment with a look at the good old days. Well, the people in Dare County say they need some rain to help put out that forest fire. Skip, there's going to be enough tomorrow to help out? Well, it's going to be kind of an iffy situation. It's going to be damp tomorrow, but not a lot of rainfall. If that were in the west, if we could move the whole thing over in the west, it might be a little better for them. Here in Raleigh-Durham, we had a high of 80 today for a from an overnight low of 56. Only a trace of rain reported up to 7 o'clock. The humidity at the moment is quite high. Well, across the nation now, a lot of very nice weather is occurring. However, a few showers up in the far northwest, Washington and Oregon. High pressure located in the high plains this evening out in the Dakotas is controlling a great deal of the nation's weather. Believe it or not, a few snow flurries down in Texas. Nothing real big, but a few flurries. And a few flurries also up around the Great Lakes. Now, the thing affecting our weather at the moment, this system is two, se two sessions of low pressure, one up in the lakes and one is located, oh, down in the western gulf. And they're moving very, very slowly. So the first one now is in the process of moving through North Carolina. It's already in the western sections of the state. We'll move on across. And most of the rainfall now has occurred that will occur in North Carolina, just brief showers for the rest of the evening. But the main rainmaker is still down in the gulf. It's just sitting there taking its time. AccuWeather thinks it's going to move up to the northeast and will stay to the west of North Carolina. That means we'll stay in the warm air, but the rain will begin to fall, mainly in the mountains, and it will be mainly late in the day tomorrow and tomorrow night, and they could get a lot of heavy rainfall. As a matter of fact, a flash flood watch is out for the western sections of our state. Currently across North Carolina,
Carolina, as you can see, very, very mild conditions. Uh, Raleigh, Durham, 64. Car Lake level is 303.4. So here's the forecast now. For tonight, cloudy skies, a 70% chance of a shower, the low 58. For tomorrow, not too much bad weather. You might even see some sunshine, a high of 74, the low 60, not much chance of rain. You might see a shower, 60% chance in the winds out of the southeast. Back in the west now, the situation is pretty much the same. The rains will be moving in about midday to late in the day tomorrow, and it could be heavy. For the beach, not bad at all, a nice weekend to be at the coast. So for the five days ahead now, the temperatures will be nice, but as you can see, unsettled weather all the way through Wednesday. Not bad weather, mind you, just unsettled. Then on Thursday, nice sky, sunny. Your day off, right? Right, you remembered. So it's going to be a nice day. <laughs> okay. Well, next Wednesday marks the day when the state unveils its plans for preserving the new river. The state wants to preserve more than 26 miles along the south fork of the river in Ashe and Allegheny counties. And Duke University President Terry Sanford says he wants to stay in the school for at least three more years. Sanford denied a Friday report that said he would retire and practice law at the new Washington, D.C. branch of his law firm. Duke requires faculty members to retire at 69 and Sanford is only 62. Well, the Federal Energy Department has fined several gasoline stations in the southeast for charging higher gasoline prices than allowed by federal regulations. Here in North Carolina, there were five stations, the closest being Dolph's Exxon in Smithfield. Well, there are a lot of people who are interested in old cars, but there are a few who have gone so far with the scene, such as one man in Sumner County, Tennessee, that his world of antique auto centers around his own antique gas station. A report from Hank Allison. Gallon of gas. Okay. This may be the most unusual gas station in America. It belongs to Pete Prater, and it's his hobby, or part of it anyway. Prater is a successful corporate executive, president of two companies around the world 58 times, all that stuff. But he also has axle grease in his blood. I was about 12 years old first, and I started working on old cars, and it just kind of hung on. When a man owns 32 old cars and a barn full of parts, what's a more natural next step than his own gas station? I tell my wife that I've never been to a psychiatrist. I don't expect to. This is my psychiatry right here. And old-time gas stations weren't pump-it-yourself places. They were friendly with reasonable prices. Pete remembers he sells gas for 13.9 cents a gallon. I'll sell you that at that price, but got a couple of rules. And the rules are that uh, your car's got to be 1941 or older, and I only sell you one gallon a year. So this, this is a, a 1903 chewing gum machine. It uh, takes a penny, it's spring wound, and I've got some gum, it doesn't seem to work. It had to hit a little bit, and that penny came back. The reason is, 1903 had more copper in the pennies, and you have to keep fiddling with it. That, that goes. If time hasn't exactly stood still here at Pete's place, it has at least been bathed in the neon of nostalgia because it's been a long time since you could get a piece of gum, a gallon of gas, and change back on your quarter. What do I owe you? That's 14 cents. Got change? Yeah, I got change. Come back next year and get your other gallon, will you? There you are. <laughs> Allison for CBS News in Sumner County, Tennessee. Well, that's Eyewitness News at 11.30. I'm Catherine Walters for Skip, Don, and the entire Eyewitness News team. Thanks for staying up so late with us. See you tomorrow night. Eleven Together, WTVD.